Hello, my name is Paul Friedman. I'm chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, and we're starting a new series, Interview with the Experts, a Heart to Heart, in which we'll discuss a timely topic in 10 minutes to hear the latest and greatest on how uh, it's part of cardiovascular care. I'm delighted to have with me today, Dr. Kyle Clarich, Vice Chair for Practice and an expert echocardiographer. Today, um, we'll be talking about papillary fibroelastoma. So, uh, Dr. Clarich, welcome. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you for talking about one of the topics that's near and dear to my heart, no pun intended. So what is a PFE? A papillary fibroelastoma, uh, otherwise fondly referred to as a PFE, because it's a hard, it's a lot to, to say papillary fibroelastoma multiple times in a single sentence, so if you shorten it up to the acronym, is a, a small uh, neoplasm. And there was a debate for a number of years whether this is actually a neoplasm or not, but it is actually a neoplasm exhibiting avascular fronds. So there's multiple fronds which have this complex branching from usually a unifying stalk or uh, attachment point to the endo endocardium or endothelium of the heart. These fronds are essentially lined hundreds and thousands of them by uh, one single layer of endothelium and the inner lining of the uh, of each of the of the fronds is collagen elastin and really a mucopolysaccharoid and occasionally a smooth muscle cell but they're avascular and therefore they're uh, they're non-malignant they're benign tumors uh, that we do see uh, uh, not infrequently on valves more than uh, endocardial services, but they've been reported on every single surface in the heart. So how does a person typically discover that they have this benign cardiac tumor, this PFE in their heart? Well, there's two ways. Um, the most common way is probably uh, what I see a lot in this day and age with so much imaging available to our cardiology colleagues that they're found incidentally. Uh, you yourself have discovered them as you're doing uh, ablations on patients that are getting their pre-ablation echocardiograms. So that does happen probably the most common way we see right now. But the, unfortunately, they often are, the second most common way is when we see them presenting clinically as a stroke or a TIA, usually embolic phenomena. It, this, since they're so small, usually less than a centimeter, it's unlikely that they cause large problems with peripheral vascular uh, areas like the legs or the feet or, or lungs for that matter. But, the, but the, certainly any small thing going to the brain can cause big damage. So most commonly picked up these days incidentally on imaging, but when you're seeing a patient, if you're not the echocardiographer, first of all, what's in your differential? What blood test you need to order? What are things you should be thinking about? Uh, and then on physical examination, uh, are there findings? What would those be? Yeah, and you know my other my other great uh, passion is physical exam, but unfortunately these, these do not cause a tumor plop like a myxoma. And again, they're most often at less than a, than a centimeter in size especially left-sided ones. Left-sided ones tend to be smaller than right-sided ones. But we do have a differential that we'd like to look into because ultrasound and echo is the most common imaging modality that we use to diagnose these or, or incidentally find them. Uh, other things that can look like papillary fibroelastomas are uh, non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, and that's a big umbrella of uh, the differential includes things that um, a malignancy that causes these little masses on valves that are really th organized thrombus or uh, lupus, which is the uh, morantic endocarditis, and those are all under the category of non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. The uh, ones that are associated with malignancy, uh, hopefully you've got some suspicion that there's a malignancy and that helps you to rule it out clinically, but on occasion we have sent patients to the OR with that, and there's no lab test necessarily that you can get for that. But there are lab tests to look for, S, uh, for um, lupus, endocar uh, lupus and the, um, the uh, non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis caused by antiphospholipid antibodies. So you want to rule out lupus with, usually I get a screening ANA, and if that's elevated, then go down the pathway of more specific testing for lupus. And, and involve our, um, our rheumatologist to kind of help guide that diagnosis and, and the likelihood that that might be in the differential. And the second most common thing uh, from a laboratory point of view that you want to make sure you get is antiphospholipid antibodies because that can also cause the non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. And that would be, a, those two entities would of course be a totally different treatment than if you just had a benign 
papillary fibroblastoma. Occasionally, um, and in the literature, there's been reports where people have thought that a healed vegetation or um, a, an active vegetation from endocarditis, bacterial endocarditis, might be a papillary fibroblastoma. In, a, in my own practice, I haven't really run into that, although I do routinely check blood cultures, but just because I wouldn't want to send someone to the operating room that happened to have uh, active endocarditis. But most of the time, the clinical setting is so different from papillary fibroblastoma and endocarditis. And you can usually pick up a history of a healed vegetation because that patient will be able to tell you, I had endocarditis. So the laboratory evaluation would include antiphospholipid antibodies and ANA, and uh, bacterial cultures, just to be on the safe side. So you've done all that, you've excluded other things, and the imaging is really characteristic. And maybe just take a second, you described them pretty elaborately early on. I know you have one image you wanted to yeah, share. Yeah, I think I can definitely go through the image. And for those of you that have uh, video for this uh, discussion, uh, we'll switch to um, an image. And what I've done here is to place an echocardiogram next to a pathologic growth specimen uh, and then an electron micrograph. And I think if you can play the video on the far left side, you can see this is a zoomed up view. And I do advocate for zoom imaging for the physicians that will be doing the echocardiograms and TEE is probably better than transthoracic. We've, we've discussed that in a number of our publications. But what you see here in the long axis view of the aortic valve on the left moving image is a highly mobile mass that has independent cardiac motion, and when I say that, I mean independent motion of the valve leaflet, and you can see the mass flops around on a stalk. You can see that clearly that there's a stalk attachment. And then the other uh, characteristic that this uh, typical mass will have is this very frondy-like appearance. Um, although they come in many different shapes and, and, uh, and forms, this is a very classic one like you might see on a board examination with that shimmering edge. In the middle you see the pathology specimen that was removed and you can see some thrombus on there. And on the far left you can see this very highly complex array of, um, of fronds that make up the complex nature of this tumor. And it's really between those fronds that we see the platelet accumulations that can lead to um, one of the mechanisms for embolization, that is clot that forms on top of the mass. The second cause of embolization would be actually tumor breaking off and going uh, downstream. And the most common places you find these? Yeah, so the aortic valve is about 60% of the time, the mitral valve uh, roughly 15%, and then right-sided valves about 5% of the time. But 20% of these are found on, uh, in chambers, the left atrium and the left ventricle being most common. They've been associated with patients that have had a prior history of radiation where the radiation caught the heart, uh, such as in Hodgkin's lymphoma or breast uh, cancer. We've had, uh, there's, they're associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because of we feel that there's endothelial damage that causes um, some stimulus, although we really don't know the true etiology yet and are still struggling to figure that out in terms of what stimulates these in some patients. And then uh, they've also been associated with um, prior heart surgery and they form typically on the scar tissue. For instance, I've seen a number of my practice on myectomy sites. So once we've made the diagnosis, we're clear of what it is, where it is, how do we treat it? Well, uh, what we have usually done in our uh, practice is to take a patient and really assess their risk because um, these, the, the incidence of papillary fibrillosoma definitely goes up with age. And so many of these patients already have other comorbidities. And what we have said is if a patient has a low risk, meaning their STS risk score is 1% one per, per or less, then we prophylactically recommend surgical removal of the papillary fibrolastoma. However, if a patient's at high risk or doesn't want to take that as an upfront, as you know, the, the risk is really low of mortality if you, patients are properly selected. And actually in pres preservation of the valve in the right uh, surgical hands, 98% of patients that underwent surg surgical removal of papillary fibrolastoma in our institution wound up with their same heart valve. In other words, we had a couple that needed to be patched, but most of the time they can be, it's a, what the surgeons like to call, and I always laugh at this, what's simple about cardiac surgery well, a simple shave excision of a papillary fibrolastoma, and that's what they call it, a shave excision. 
But if they aren't a surgical candidate, then we've been typically recommending antiplatelet medications, and that's because of the platelet clots that the pathologist has seen, and it's, a, it's an expert recommendation. It has nothing to do with randomized trials, uh, but it, we've also had clinical experience with patients having embolization on anticoagulants such as warfarin, uh, but you know they can embolize two different ways. They can embolize by the platelet clots that form on them. They can embolize by part of the tumor breaking off. So we wouldn't expect anticoagulation to entirely remove the risk of, of, of embolization. So once you have one of these removed, can it come back? Unfortunately, we have seen uh, less than 2% uh, of patients would have one come back. What we have actually discovered, though, is usually when this happens uh, and we retrospectively go back, maybe we missed a really tiny papillary fibroblastoma in the beginning uh, or they're in a different location. So I think, I think one of the situations that we need to be very cognizant of if we're imagers is that we need to do a very careful assessment of all the valves of any prior surgical area in the heart and make sure that we don't see other papillary fibroblastomas, even really tiny ones. And if, the, if we're suspicious of that, and we're taking a patient to the OR, we really wanna get that intraoperative TEE and look very carefully because they are multiple in uh, probably around 8% of the cases. Mm. Um, last question for you. Are there new treatments on the horizon? You've got this tiny thing in your heart, it's benign. Open surgery seems like a big deal. Um, look in your crystal ball and what do you see down the road for new ways to treat these? Well, I'm, a, I'm enthusiastic that at some point in time, and we've been actively trying to pursue this in our own practice, is a percutaneous solution. Uh, complicated by the fact of the various places that these things wind up in the heart. So you have to have access. To, right now, the least invasive way we can get these out is by robotics if they're on the AV valve, so the mitral or tricuspid valve. And we can do a mini thoracotomy if they're on the aortic or pulmonary valve. However, um, it would be great if we had something like a TAVR for papillary fibroblastoma, if there's something that we could do to snare it out. And, and we are actively pursuing different options. There's not a great animal model. Uh, there is no animal model actually that I'm aware of, and therefore it makes it a little bit uh, difficult to, uh, and these tumors are essentially very rare. Uh, the average cardiologist who reads echoes will see one papillary fibroblastoma and they have to be alert for it. They have to have their antenna up and not like write it off as artifact or something. But I think uh, one in 1,000 echoes. So you, know, you will see them, but they're not extremely common. Yeah, and, and that's why it's so important to have um, the benefit of people with interest in it who have seen hundreds, if not thousands, to kind of guide us in how to manage these. Um, because the consequences of missing these can be severe, as you pointed out at the beginning, it can be a stroke. So Dr. Kyle Klarich, thank you for joining me in our interview with the experts and for giving us an update on PFEs, how to recognize them and how to treat them. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.